So we've been in this series called Summer in the Psalms. And what we've been doing is really simple. We've, we're going to take all summer and just look at different psalms each day, each Sunday. Um, so with the psalms, some of them are prayers, some of them are hymns, but, uh, and they're songs, they're written to be songs, but there's also, if you look throughout all of them, all of them can be placed into music because they're all poems. And uh, one of the commentaries that I read actually last week um, was, it, it described it as like a hymn book. So when we look at the book of Psalms, we're like, oh, there's just so many of them. There's 150. Like, how could we ever get through there? Like I, I told uh, our Bible study, I said, if we go through all the Psalms, we'll be here until I'm dead. And then we probably still won't be through all of them. But there's so many because, you know, if you look about your hymn book, your hymn book has like 400 some odd songs in it. And this was their songs of worship. This is what they used in worship in their temple services, in their church services, and even going into the early church after Jesus had lived, died, and rose again and ascended into heaven. They're still using these psalms as songs during their worship. And this is what all day today is going to be about uh, as far as the service goes. We're just going to be talking about worship because this is the heart of most of the psalms is worship and praise. Even in the ones where they're lamenting or they're complaining about things that are happening in their life, whoever the psalmist is, or if it's David talking about all of his hurts, it always ends with some sort of worship towards God. And uh, when I think about worship, I go back to my own life when I'm sitting there in, in church. My dad was the pastor of every church that I was a part of. And we're sitting there in church and we're looking in the hymns. And I remember feeling the presence of God while we were singing hymns. And I would look around and everyone looked like they just had a sour grape. But man, the worship was there. You could hear it in the way that they were singing, even though their facial expression was not showing nothing to anyone. And even though they were standing there like this, not moving, making sure their hands did not move, you could feel it because you knew that they meant every single word. There's also churches that we've been in, uh, because if you don't know anything about my dad, my dad uh, was a General Baptist pastor, which is kind of obvious that I would become one. My uncle's a General Baptist pastor, so I had no chance of not being a pastor. But he, he grew up in a home where one side was very Pentecostal, and the other side was very Baptist. And so he called himself a Bapticostal. So I grew up in a general Baptist Bapticostal home, which means that I, I've, I've not been in very many Pentecostal services, but I know what they're like because I've seen them. And, and I remember hearing this one guy uh, on, on a video. He was talking about his Pentecostal church experience. And he was a kid, he was a little kid, and he was watching as as people were getting up and they were praising God and they were throwing themselves down on the ground, he didn't understand what was happening. He said, and then this one lady that was sitting right next to them got up and just started running laps around the church. And he looked over to his mom and he said, mom, what is she doing? She said, don't, don't talk about it. He's like, no, no, no. I need to know right now what is happening because I didn't know that we could run around the church and this lady's doing it. And she said, well, that's called a Jericho march. She's running around the church in praise of God. And he said, did she read the story about Jericho? Because it didn't end well for the people in Jericho. And they said, mom, we need to stop her at lap six. Make sure she doesn't get to lap seven. Right? So then you see the Pentecostal side and you think immediately, you're like, wow, they're really praising Jesus in there. But can I tell you, and you probably already know this, in both of those services, there's people who are faking their worship. There's the people in the, in the Baptist, it tends to be a Baptist Methodist background, where they're sitting in there, and they're, they're as, as straight as can be because that's the worship atmosphere that they grew up with. And they sing the words, but they don't mean a single one. And then there's also the Pentecostals. They'll be up, they'll, they'll be running around, or the, the Charismatics, they'll be running around, they'll be waving their flags, they'll be throwing themselves on the ground, and they leave feeling even more empty than when they came in. There's a problem with our praise. 
And I think the problem came from the church. It didn't come from the outside world. This is our world. Worshiping the true living God, there's a problem with our praise. There's the story of a man several, several years ago. Uh, he was an American man. He, he married uh, a woman from the Middle East. And they, they moved to the Middle East and uh, started preaching the gospel. So he and along with his wife, they're, they're leading this rapidly growing underground church. Thousands of people were, were secretly coming to this church that they had built because around this area, it was nothing but Muslims. And all these Muslims were turning to Christ in, in this very Islamic world, and it was exploding with growth. And they led this for years, and it was a very dangerous situation for them. See, in this part of the world, if they were caught sharing the gospel with anyone, you would be thrown in prison and tortured. And if you were a, a woman follower of Christ, it was likely going to include rape or other type of sexual assaults against you. And then if you're a man, you had all of these very physical bad things happen, painful experiences happening just for saying the name of Jesus. So it's a very dangerous part of the world. And each morning, this husband and his wife would part ways acknowledging to one another that it may be the very last time that they see each other. Because they knew that when they parted their ways and they went to their two different churches that they were trying to build and, and gone and proclaiming Christ to people in different situations, they both, both knew if they got caught, they would be tortured and executed. And while they were leading this underground church, this man and his wife were given the opportunity to move to, to the United States. And so they took it. They went to the United States, and they lived here for a period of time, and then they, they left the United States. Now, when asked in an interview, why did you leave the U.S. when, when your Islamic country that you're in was so dangerous that you didn't even know if you're going to see your wife, you didn't know if you're going to see your husband the very next hour. Why would you leave this place that has so much freedom and people can freely worship? And the wife told the interviewer this. It was like there was a satanic lullaby playing here and all of the Christians are asleep and I felt like we were falling asleep too. So they went back home. John Bloom, an article writer for Desiring God, said it this way as he's writing out this article. If we're not feeling the anguish over people's eternal state and ordering our lives around praying for them and trying to find ways to bring the gospel to them, we are being lulled to sleep by the devil's soothing strains. There's a problem with our praise. And you may be thinking, well, I feel very spiritually alive. You know, I, I'm not the most expressive in my worship, but I feel spiritually alive. I read my Bible. I pray. I go to church. I sing the songs. I do everything that I'm supposed to do. I want to simply ask you this about our church that you're involved in right now. Have you even noticed that it's been almost a year since we've had a baptism? And if that's shocking news to you, you didn't notice. And then this, this next question is going to be really easy for you to answer. Did you even care? Listen, I, I know us as a church, we've gone through a, a big season of, of what appears like growth. Okay, I mean, like a year and a half ago, we had 40 people come into this church. Today, as it stands, I mean, we've not, I've not taken attendance or anything, but last week... As it stands, we're averaging 88 a Sunday, Include, not, not just in here, but also including Grove Kids over there in the annex. So we've more than doubled what we had a year and a half ago. And, and I'll just be really honest with you, for a while, I didn't notice that all of our growth tended to be transfer growth, people coming from other churches. And we're glad to have you. It's not that but my main concern is seeing us grow in this way to where we're seeing people's lives transformed by the gospel. Now, I do have a praise that we do have a baptism that's going to be coming up soon. But still, did you even notice? Did it bother you? 
because you saw how the church was moving. You saw all the things at the annex that was happening. Everything seemed to be good, but we were missing one major piece. And it began to bother me, and it began to break me. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. But if you didn't notice, if it didn't bother you, you might already be asleep. And so my goal is to hopefully help wake you up from this satanic lullaby. Something that happens with, with what Satan does with people in churches, I think, this is just my personal opinion, I think what he does is he, he gets us so familiar with the songs. He allows us to get so familiar with the hymns, with the songs that we sing, that we come in here and we sing them, and we're somewhat bored. And we, we come in, we sing, because we know the words. We don't want other people to look at us and see us not singing, and, and so we sing too. Or maybe we actually enjoy the songs. We just don't enjoy the meaning. Because we love the beat, we, we love the words, but we don't actually know what we're singing. So we get so comfortable in our, in our rhythms where you know, we, we have morning announcements and then we sing three songs and then a Pastor Logan comes up and he, and he preaches for about 35 minutes on a good Sunday and then, and then we go and we sing the last song and then we're out of here. And if that's your experience, if that's all you know about worship in this church, then as your pastor, I am deeply sorry and know that I've been praying for you because that is not our best and we are to give our best in worship. Sometimes when we're under this satanic lullaby, we praise God in the good times because it's easy to praise God in the good times. But then we pretend to praise God in the middle of the storm because we know that we're supposed to. We know that we have to. Or, or we don't want other people to think that we're not spiritual so that we sit in this place and we're like, well, you know, uh, my mom's got cancer and, 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 you know, I'm dealing with all these health issues and financially we're basically on the verge of bankruptcy and I've got all these other problems in my life, but praise God, he is good. Simply so that other people think or uh, have this portrayal of us that we are really worshipful, that we're really deep in our relationship with God. And the reality is, is that we're just sleeping, waiting for the day that we don't have to go to church anymore, that we don't have to see our problems face to face. It's like this quote that I heard a long time ago, and I didn't put it in my notes, so I'm going to butcher it, but it's fine. Um, There's this quote that said, um, would you enjoy heaven? If, if heaven was all of the greatest food that you could ever have and, and that was there and all of your friends, all of your family, all of them were all there. You had fun all the time. Everything that you enjoy about your life was even more so great when you got to heaven, but God wasn't there, but Christ wasn't there. Would you enjoy heaven? Now, the, the Christian response is, well, no, because Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, and, and I would never want to be, but just bear with me. If you're truly honest with yourself, even if you're the best Christian in the world, if you're truly honest with yourself, you would love the comfort. You would love the peace. But would you love Christ? And that's what that quote that person was trying to bring out, but there's a problem with our praise. You know, a little bit of the, of the church world coming in, thinking about my different experiences and hearing the experiences of worship with others. I know like in, in, in the charismatic background, there's people who who just aren't expressive in their worship, and that's fine. I'm not expressive in my worship, but it's consistent with most everything that I do, right? Okay, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> Why I pointed to her, you'll, you'll understand here in a second. But, what I, but they, they're not expressive in worship, but they feel like they have to, and so they put on a show so that other people think that they're, they're worshiping. And then you've got people in the, you know, Baptist, more uh, 
It's mostly Baptist, okay? I'm talking to Baptist people here, so we get it. But uh, the Baptist group, they're, they're sitting there, and, and there's some in here who are craving to be expressive in their worship, but they feel like they can't because everyone else is following suit, standing there, reading it, looking up to their one screen. I think I'm the only one in here that switches screens between that one and this one. Everyone else, you know, you got your monitor picked out, right? And so there's some who are, who are actually wanting to be very charismatic in their worship, but they feel like they can't because the church has suppressed it. In fact, there's a, there's a church that I, I heard about. Uh, they're a thriving church now. They're a mega church now. They've got more than 15,000 going there. But when the guy, when the pastor that's currently there now started, they had about 70 or 80 going there. And they told them part of their theology uh, for evangelism was that we are not expressive in our worship because uh, the outsiders who come in will think that we're weird. And that was the culture of the church, this Baptist church. The culture of it was you don't raise your hand in worship because someone's going to think you're weird raising your hand. Yet, when you look out in the world and we we go to concerts, we go to the sports games, what are we doing? Raising our hands. We're cheering. Right? And and there's, there's an inconsistency. Now, here's why I said I'm consistent. It's not to say that I'm better than anyone because I'll tell you how broken I was in my praise. But when I'm I'm sitting here in church, you'll see me. I've got my hands here. I have my eyes closed for a reason. It's it's how I help prepare my heart to, to go towards or to point my heart towards God. But rarely will you see me go like this. I do, but rarely do you see it because I'm not expressive in my worship, just like I'm not expressive in Kentucky basketball games. I'm not. Chloe has told me before, watching you watch a Kentucky basketball game is the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life (laughs) because I just watch it. I'm not really expressed. Inside, I'm like cheering them on and like, yes, yes. But on the outside, I'm just like, (laughs) right? This This is my Kentucky basketball watching face right here for the whole three hours. Like. Yeah, oh, okay, Chloe says that's occasionally I'll switch hands. But <laughs> that, that's about as charismatic as I get. But there's the consistency. I'm not a very charismatic, I'm not a very like, outgoing guy at all. I know it's weird because I'm on stage, but I'm not outgoing at all. And that shows up in my own worship. The goal is to get you to not be like me, but to be like yourself in worship. To where if you don't feel like you have to raise your hand, you don't need to. Because you're in an audience of one. You're not worshiping so that other people see. You're worshiping so that God sees. So that God is pleased with the worship that you offer. He doesn't want a fake version of yourself. He wants you. And this is where we get to our psalm for today. Psalm 103. And I'm going to go kind of verse by verse with this because Psalm 103 is the first of four songs of praise that end this last or this fourth book of the book of Psalms. And I truly believe that Psalms like this, which is why I'm mentioning this one today, can help fix our problem with our praise because it reminds us why we praise in the first place. The first two verses read this, and they're just a call to worship, a call to praise. It says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So if we praise God with all of us, that's what God desires. He doesn't desire just some of us. He desires all of us when we're in these spaces to worship, and it doesn't have to happen in church It can happen on your car ride home. It can happen while you're inside of your own home. Uh, I I saw this post from a pastor friend of ours. Uh, His wife was out picking blackberries and started worshiping God while she was picking blackberries. Worship can happen in every single part of our life, and that's how it's meant to be. But when we praise, when we worship, our full attention is on him. Don't let Satan distract you in this place with your to-do list that you have planned out today, 
with where you're going to eat because now you're starting to get hungry because I just mentioned it. You're not distracted by all of those other things. Your full attention is on the one true God. Every emotion, every thought, every breath is meant to praise his holy name. And you should feel it welling up inside of you to the point to where you can't help, but can, you can't contain it, the praise that you give God. No one else might see it, but inside of your heart, you feel the depth of your worship. So you praise him, but you don't just praise him. You praise him so that you don't forget what he's already done in your life. So let's, let's go through the rest of this real quick and, and remind you of some of those things. Psalm 103, three through five, who forgives all of your sins and heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Man, he forgave your sins even though you were a sinner. He looked at you in your sin, in your filth, and he said, I still love them and I'm gonna forgive them even though they sinned against me and even though everything that they deserve because of their sinfulness should come their way. I love them anyways, and I'm going to forgive them. Their life was in a pit. They were digging their hole so deep that they couldn't even get their own selves out. And since it was so deep, I saw them, I had compassion on them. And so I picked them back up with all of my love and compassion so that they wouldn't have to live in that pit anymore, but they would be redeemed into life. Psalm 103, 6 through 7. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all of the oppressed. He made his ways known to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. This is a call for us to even look back and study more scripture and say, God is continuing to be righteous because he always has just judgment. And he's always full of mercy and grace. His righteousness was given to us through Christ. And the justice that he has is for all of the oppressed, all of the victims. And he made his way known to Moses, especially when he brought them out of Egypt. So when you think about your own life, something that God has done for you has gotten you out of your bad relationships. Something that God has done for you has gotten you out of your bad habits. Something that God has done for you has gotten you out of your sinful ways. He's gotten you out of those terrible circumstances that you faced in your life. He's gotten you out of your own personal Egypt. So he's worthy of our praise. Psalm 103, 8 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For the high as in the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. Again, God looked at all of your sinfulness. And he said, I'll throw it as far as the east is from the west because there's no end. There's no measurable amount of distance from east to west. So I will throw them so far away that I will basically forget them. I'll forget all of your sinful ways. When you come to me and I actually forgive you and I I redeem you and I bring you into a new life because I'm slow to anger. Slow to anger when you sin against me, but I'm abounding in love. Can I just tell you this? Uh, I've mentioned this before that that I had anger issues when I was growing up. I know mom's watching this at home, so she'll she'll appreciate this story for like the 20th time that I've told this church. Um, But when I was a kid, I had anger issues. I would bite my mom, just bitter, because I was mad at her. And then when dad got on to me and told me that I wasn't allowed to bite mom anymore, I would go over to the couch and I'd bite the couch and I'd look her dead in the eye this is for you, right? This is what, that, that's what I would do. I had anger issues. And uh, I suppressed all of those issues for a long, long time until about, I don't know, three years ago, I started praying for God to reveal some things in me that I didn't know was in me still. And one of those was anger. And 
uh, in that season while I'm trying to deal with my anger. I don't have it completely handled or anything like that. So don't think that. You'll probably never see the anger because I know how to suppress it when I need to. So you'll never see that. But I, I'm not as slow to anger as I thought I was. Now, I'm slower to anger now than I was back then when I started uh, getting all of those emotions and that anger back out of me after all those years of suppressing it. But if God was as slow to anger as I am with myself and with other people, none of us would be here. We would all just eventually, God would say, fine, you do what you want to. I'm going to step out. And then he would watch the world that he created burn. And for most of us in our anger, we would love to see that happen with whoever we're angry at or whatever circumstance we're angry at. We would love to just step out and say, let it burn because I'm mad. But no, our God is slow to anger. So even when you continuously sin against him over and over and over again, when you continue to nail his son's hands deeper and deeper and deeper into the cross, he's slow to anger and he's abounding in love. But his anger will come at one day. His anger, his wrath will be released one day. And our goal as Christians is to ensure that the fewest amount of people possible are going to experience that wrath. When you talk about Jesus saving us, he's saving us from the consequence of our sins, which is God's wrath. He's slow to anger, but he's not ignoring his anger. He will not always accuse. He'll not harbor his anger forever, like I just said. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Man, if he did... I don't even think the world would still be existing at this point. It would have ended thousands and thousands of years ago. Psalm 103, 13 through 18, we'll continue on with the things that God's done for you. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He has compassion on you. He shows you how we were formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of the mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower in the field, the wind blows over and it's gone. The place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness is with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. What this is saying is that he knows that we're all mortal, but he's everlasting. His love does not last for mortality. It lasts for a lifetime, and it doesn't last just for a lifetime. It lasts for all of eternity. So his love for you started from the very beginning of creation, and it will continue to last all the way into eternity, forever and ever. His love will be there for you. One, or 103, 19 through 22, the Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you, his servants, who will do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. See, there's a problem with our praise. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my problem that I had with praise. Maybe even I still haven't. I remember I was, I was sitting here and, you know, I was getting caught up in, in all the annex renovations. I was getting caught up in the growth that we were experiencing as a church. And me being church leadership minded, I, I'm like, okay, how do we manage this? If we continue to grow at this rate, there's going to be a time where, where this is going to be unmanageable under our own system. So I need to find a new system. I need to build a new system so that we can manage this growth. And I'm thinking about all these things, the strategic leadership side of it that most people don't see pastors actually go through. And, and, and I'm, I'm working through all these things and I sit there and I'm like, we haven't had a baptism since July of last year. Why doesn't that bother me? 
Why, why am I not bothered by it? There is a problem with my praise. And I remember I, after I vocalized it out loud in my office, I was like, it just started to completely tear me up inside. And it's when then when Satan started showing me all these other churches who are having 10, 15 baptisms, people who are having baptisms, it seems like every single week in this area. And I'm like, man, what, what did I do? My praise is broken. And it was, I think it was actually last Sunday. I'll tell this story. Last Sunday, I go up here on the altar, like I did, and, and I pray to God, and I'm just like, God, I know my praise is broken. I know I've just been singing the songs just to sing them. I know I've not been truly worshiping you. I know that something's off, and I don't know what it is. But Lord, help me get to the place to where I can see it. Help me get to the place to where you restore this praise that I've lost for you, that I've broke myself. I sat there, or I kneeled down right there. I got up. I sang the rest of the song, kind of discouraged. And then we had the, the vacation Bible school meeting. And after the vacation Bible school meeting, I, I went and talked to, um, to Tiffany. And we, we talked for a little bit just about church leadership stuff, how we were going to run VBS, all those things. And before she left, I don't, you, you don't know this, before she left, she turned around and she said, hey, I want to tell you something. Maggie's wanting to get baptized. And I know I didn't show it, but I went home and I teared up. And I'm like, man, God is so good that he answered that quick to restore some of my praise that I lost. I had been praying for a baptism all year long. And it wasn't until a couple months ago that I realized that I was just praying it because I knew we needed one. I was just praying it because I knew that it would look good on my resume. That would look good on something to write down as my list of accomplishments that I've done for this church. You know, I've helped lead up the Annex Project. I've grown the church this much. Man, I want to have some baptisms in there so that when I stand on my retirement day, when I stand before the Lord, I could tell him, yeah, look what I did at Shady Grove. And now I realize even more so than I did before, God's going to say, look what I did through you at Shady Grove General Baptist Church. It wasn't because you had this strategic plan to have baptisms involved in your worship services. It's because I drew them in, and your people that were there were faithful to me, so I was faithful to them. And so as your pastor, I just want to end with this. I take full responsibility that there's not been a baptism here in almost a year. I take full responsibility for it because my praise was broke. And I know wherever the pastor leads, the church will follow. I don't want your praise to be broke either. That's why this message is so important to me. If we can look at the actual problem with our praise, it's not that we're not singing songs. It's not that we're not coming in here and, and at least giving ourselves the illusion that we're worshiping. Some of us are worshiping, and I see it. I know it. But, but to come in here and know that it's not, it's not a physical problem. It's a heart problem. In this moment, while I've been thinking about my own praise and how broken it was, I thought to myself, I'm like, God, why, why is my praise broken? And he said, you settled for the songs and not the words. You've settled with knowing what I've done for you, but not for who I am. 
all of this psalm, it lists out different reasons why you should praise God, but the overall psalm is talking about this is who God is. It's not so much the things that he's done for you, that he's forgiven you, and since he's forgiven you, you should be manipulated into worshiping him because he forgave you. No, it's God is a forgiving God who is slow to anger. He's abounding in love. And since he is that way, it should well up inside of me that he's allowed me to be a part of that, that he's allowed me to have some sort of worship of him. And so I worship not because he's done all these great things in my life, not that he's done all these great things in this church. I worship him because I know who he is. And so I love him. And so it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks about the way that I worship because I'm in an audience of one. I worship him, not people. I worship him, not the songs that I like. I worship him alone, not for what he's done. Although that is a great big part of it, but the biggest part is I worship him for who he is. And since he is who he is, he deserves more praise than I can ever get. So I give him my all. And that's what I want to ask you to do. So we sing this last song, Oh, Come to the Altar. I'd invite you, come up to the altar. If your praise has been broken, if you realize that you've been sitting there maybe for the last couple weeks, or maybe it was just today, or maybe it's been for the past several years, like, I've just been singing the songs because I know them. I've not actually been worshiping with the hymns. I've not actually been worshiping with the, with the praise and worship contemporary songs. I've not been doing any of that. If that's you, I invite you to come up. I know you don't have to come up. That's really charismatic of us as Baptists, but you can come up to the altar and pray and say, God, my praise is broken. There's a problem with my praise, and I need you to fix it because I can't fix it myself. I'd invite you to come up to the altar. And if your praise is not broken, work so hard to keep it from being broken because you will regret it if it breaks.